uh, at Work Project at the Mennonite New Life Center in Toronto. She's a building blocks leader. And I had these huge bios, which seemed really long. And I wasn't going to read them, but you know what? I'm going to read some of it because I just think these, these bios are amazing. Adrienne is the coordinator of the newcomer skills at Work Project at the Mennonite New Life in Toronto. Her training and practice in social justice and human rights spans 20 years of work in both Colombia and Canada. She brings over four years of direct engagement with immigrant communities in Toronto around topics of economic, social, and civic inclusion. Adriana has led three participatory action research projects <clears throat> investigating the access to fair and meaningful employment for newcomers and exploring the civic and political participation of immigrant communities. Please welcome Adriana. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm here because I have been invited to present you the experience of the Latin American Civic Participation Campaign. Um, we are a um, community-based initiative of 18 settlement agencies, community groups, and social organizations that work together to promote civic and political engagement of the Latin American community in Toronto through public education community-based analysis and organizing. Here are the list of the 18 organizations who are currently working in the campaign. Um, so I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, you can just uh, see them. So we had invited to ask uh, two, three questions. The first one is why and how we create this campaign. In for certain, in 2009, uh, the Mennonite New Life Center opened a new office at Kiel R. Wilson in an effort to deepen our relation with the Latin American community, a community that we have been working with since our foundation in 1983. As part of the research and need assessment we made to open this office, we had the opportunity to talk with many of these agencies and organizations, and we were very inspired to um, focus in building a meaningful in partnerships in this area. At the same time, we were in the context of our Newcomer Skill at Work project, we were reflecting with Latin American members of the Newcomer Advocacy Committee around the struggles and systemic barriers they were facing to fully integrate into the Canadian society. We are right together to the idea that it was vi vital to strengthen Latin American new immigrants' voices through promoting greater uh, civic participation of the Latin, uh, Latin American community as a whole. And they insist that our, our community should be able to exercise their political rights and gain access to core Canadian institutions at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. So this campaign, as many of the experiences that you see uh, before, start from the grassroots conversation. So we're community groups, people from the Newcomer Advocacy Committee, who start, uh, who invite us actually to come and to uh, talk about this initiative. In June 2010, we invite other organizations, that is the, se the second level. Uh, we invite the Black Community Health Center, we invite the North Presbyterian Church and the Canadian Sp Hispanic Congress, and, and invite them to, to explore what do their ideas about this topic. Um, we agree that in Toronto there were a great variety of groups, organizations, agencies, faith congregations, and unions that, he, that had been working, some of them for several decades, on promoting an active involvement of the Latin American community at civic, civic issues. However, we also agree that in the context at that time, 2010, uh, the context of the municipal election, it was very pertinent to invite all of them to come together and to try to, you know, put together our skills, our, our effort to promote a civic campaign. So we started a campaign um, in basically in June 2010, and for several for some months before we start, we launched the campaign in, two, in September. It's not working. Okay, no. <laughs> we um, have a several conversation and we are right to the following uh, goals and tactics. Um, you already know the objective. Um, uh, the goals, uh, two main goals. The first one is building a collective and a, an unified uh, advocacy agenda to encourage political representatives, at that moment municipal candidates, to take action on issues of concern to the Latin American community. That is why my my teacher, Dina, can say it was the moment of framing the agenda. 
<laughs> the second goal was around promoting greater understanding of the electoral system and greater electoral participation by Latin Americans. And it was all about building capacity through knowledge and awareness. Uh, the tactics that we use in each of them were briefly uh, in the first one to analyze report and such economic uh, and civic level of inclusion of the Latin American community in Toronto, create this collective agenda of concern and public recommendation, and to promote public forums uh, in which community members can come and debate their concerns and their proposals. The tactics around the second uh, goal where we really believe in, uh, in popular education process, so, so we implement popular education process, um, create um, popular education material like brochures, uh, training toolkits, most of them bilingual in Spanish and English, and um, also we invite the media to be, to, Spanish media to be part of that, of that um, experience. So for the last three years, we have been working together. As I say, I'm not going to uh, describe in detail all the action that we have done, but in 2010, in general, we were working around municipal uh, elections. So as I say, we started from uh, reflecting about our community. We needed, we, we needed to know what community we are talking about, what are the concerns and the needs. So we created a shop. After that, we uh, promote these workshops in which uh, we invite community members to understand what, what is the, the, the voting process, materials, media covers, and we arrive to uh, uh, a forum that in, um, in which for first time, the Latin American community come invite candidates and talk uh, about specific issues related with our, our, our community. In 2011, um, yeah, we have, remember, we have the, the contest of uh, uh, federal elections, so we needed to understand, and many of the members of the community have no idea what it, why we have, we're gonna have uh, elections, so we have in all a, pro, a, a huge process of analyzing why, um, open group conversation, workshop, et cetera, to explain that. Um, trying to move from the electoral moment. I mean, we understand the electoral moments are very important, but try to move from them. We, uh, we start creating this community mapping exercise around one big issue in our community that is employment and income. So it was a, a, another experience of building of building um, this campaign. Uh, we continue creating materials and the, for, for the first time, we, we broadcast um, a pre-election forum through a community radio, uh, a Spanish community radio, Radio Voces Latinas. And in 2012 is when we, uh, you know, recognize the Building Blocks Project as a very viable <coughs> avenue for the advance of our goals. So we take the idea of building uh, of building block, uh, and based on that, we design a, a, a bigger <laughs> capacity building process uh, for 2012 that we call unlocking our civic power. So we not only uh, create one training, we 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 came from the for delivering three series of three trainings. So around 60 people were attending that uh, that. Um, that process, and at the end, 12 of them are right now working in a very specific project of um, um, create a, um, a promote civic and political participation of women who are over 18 and who live or, or work in the North York area of Toronto. So finally, um, we have been asked to share with you the, our main main um, insights and key, key learnings. So. When we, it's important to say that the following learnings are not only resulting from our experience uh, working together in this campaign. Preparing this sharing, uh, I realized that many people who are participating in this process came to Canada with a solid experience in the community engagement field. As Latin Americans, we are coming from a long history of social movements in which progressive approaches such as popular education, participatory action research, critical literacy, pedagogy of the press, and others were very familiar. So it's, it's, it's also bringing all that, that skill that we have in our own countries and, and put at work here. So there are three main insights. The first one is how we come from the critical reflection to the action for change. The second one is how we come from the individual to the collective. And the third one is how we have been moving from the lack of knowledge to the awareness. So briefly, uh, the first one, 
coming from the critical reflection to the to the action for change. So as you see in, in my brief description of the activity that we have done, we always try to start from reflecting, for understanding our historical reality, for understanding what is what we are where we are living, what are the problems. We re-report, we create our own report. In topics like immigration trends, poverty issue, we also examine um, narratives and social perception of how com our community is perceived, what kind of stereotypes or bias we have to counter in, in, in the campaign. Um, however, in the, um, it, sorry, in defining structural barriers has moved us also to a more unsystemic analysis instead of individualistic approach. You see, uh, you heard Dina when she was talking of how bad is that individualistic approach. However, understanding and explaining social inequalities reality has not been enough. So we really, what we really want is to change in through trivial actions, like proposing civic, uh, public recommendation, um, participating in public debates. I have to run a little bit, okay. Um, and finally, we're moving from the critical reflection to the action for change through emphasizing in learning by doing. So in our educational process, we do that. The second uh, is coming from the lack, lack of knowledge. So we, we were starting valuing the, 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 the knowledge of the community, but we also recognize that even many of the community members are eager to participate. They need to, very specific knowledge about how to understand the system, etc. Knowledge for us is not only to memorize data, is to, to develop skills. Um, and finally, our third learning is how we can come from the individual to the collective. So for, for all of the organization who has been working individually, uh, come together and, 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 and learn, pro, uh, learn how to build process of trust, respect, and tolerance has been a great uh, impact. Um, I don't want to go without telling honestly the big, one of the big challenges that we have had. So I have been talking a lot about communi the community, Latin American, Latin American civic uh, community, but there is no such as one community, homogeneous community who live in proximity. Um, our community are made for women and men for over 18 countries uh, with different social backgrounds, classes, etc. So where we are coming together in this campaign is our experience of being immigrants. Um, so um, that was briefly our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Um, the next presenter is Niambi Martin-John. Naomi is a professional grassroots community developer, advocate, and organizer. She brings an eclectic background of fundraising management in the cultural arts and nonprofit, nonprofit sector, as well as hands-on, cutting-edge community building in low-income neighborhoods, working with racialized and marginalized communities. In her current role as a community developer for the Malton Community Building Project, Niambi seeks to influence dynamic political and social change in the at-risk community of Malton. She has laid the foundation for increased civic participation among community residents. Working with residents to realize the role they can play in building their community, she has empowered others to take on key leadership roles in the community. Please welcome Niambi. Thank you very much. So I'm just gonna come, can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm just gonna come down uh, to speak. It's interesting how your bio always sounds way greater than who you really are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna come down here to speak, to be closer to you guys, and simply because I don't speak from notes, this is a conversation about what is happening in Malton, and um, this is truly how we work grassroots close to the people, so. Um, I represent Malton Community Building Project, which um, is a five-year civic engagement, community development, and civic literacy project in the at-risk community of Malton. And what makes this project unique is that it um, engages individuals from two distinct ethnocultural groups, the black community and the South Asian community. And MCBP uh, was established in 2008, and the first phase of the project simply focused on the development of leadership capacity in the black community. Then about three years into phase one, phase two started that focused on building leadership capacity within the South Asian community. 
Malton Community Building Project takes a collaborative approach to delivering programs in the community. And that simply means under the heading or under the banner of Malton Community Building Project, we have about 15 service organizations, social service organizations that have come together and brought their expertise in engaging the community in literacy, in education, in health promotion, to really meet the needs of the community where they're at and to empower individuals to take ownership of their own community and ownership of their future. So as it says up there, we've done health promotion, parent education, recreation, literacy, advocacy, we host community events, etc. Some of the key outcomes of Malton Community Building Project is that we want to develop a, an increased sense of community belonging. We want to increase awareness of services and supports available in the community. We want enhanced adult and parental involvement in the community, because that's one of the big struggles in at-risk communities. We want increased local issues, needs, and opportunities, or we want to raise awareness of, of local issues, needs, and opportunities, and develop the appropriate actions and responses at a community level to those things. We want increased youth participation, particularly in leadership roles. And we want to, at the end of this project, so at the end of this um, Malton Community Building Project, unite two distinct ethnocultural communities to work together uh, to build Malton. The reason we uh, chose to get involved with the Building Blocks Project, um, this map shows uh, basically the social risk index uh, of Peel region. And that small area that is circled um, is the Malton area. And I'm not sure if you can see clearly, but red indicates an extremely high social risk index. And all of Malton is almost all red. And the Malton profile basically looks like this. It's a high Im new immigrant population. There is significant cultural, ethnic, and religious diversity. There's a high occurrence of single income, single parent households. There's a large number of high school dropouts. There's high unemployment. There's significant uh, incidence of drug-related crime. There's increasing poverty and diminishing socioeconomic conditions. And Malton also has a very low voter turnout. 51% of, uh, of the population speak a language other than English as their first language. We have 59% of the population in Malton as immigrants, and 70% of those people are visible minorities. So this, when you, when you look at socioeconomic factors and you look at social risk index, Malton has a very high social risk index. When we uh, decided that civic literacy and civic participation was going to be one of our key undertakings through the Malton Community Building Project, we knew that we had to tap into uh, this segment, the youth. And what we did is we delivered training to the youth on how government works and how they can have a voice in influencing government decisions and decisions around issues affecting youth in the community. And as a result of the two trainings we did with a number of youth in the community, they were empowered to form an advisory council, a youth advisory council, that then went to the city of Mississauga and the region of Peel and made deputations about the fact that they wanted more free programming in the community for youth, a youth center space, a safe space where youth could congregate and participate in programs. But one of the key things these kids brought out was that they were a really strong voice for themselves and for other youth who are not yet empowered to speak about what they want in their community. And um, it was funny because they really put people on the spot. Because a lot of times when youth start to talk about or we want programming, there's a lot of social service providers that say, but, but you have programs. There's basketball in the community center or whatever it is. 
and these youth made it really clear that they felt discriminated against because they came from a poor uh, community that they were always stereotyped and given certain types of programming. So it was always basketball. And they made it very clear that they are more than that. And they want programs in the arts. They want access to music and drama and all those great things. So I would say that one of our key successes is that the youth were then able to apply for grants to do the type of programming that they would like to see in the community. And some of our youth were successful recipients of um, a grant from the United Way and the region of Peel to implement arts programs in the community. This is just a shot of the kids making their deputation before the Mississauga City Council. Another key demographic that we decided to engage um, as part of our civic literacy campaign was women. And we worked with two uh, groups in Malton, Malton Women's Council, which is a predominantly South Asian women's group, and Malton Moms, which was a predominantly black um, women's group in Malton. And both of those groups have done amazing things. And as a result of building blocks, we're proud to say that they've now come under one umbrella. So you have a group that was distinctly, mostly South Asian, and a group that was predominantly blacks working together to build capacity within the community and to fight for women's rights in the community. Um, both of these groups have trained advocacy volunteers that have made a number of presentations to women to women's groups in the community. Um, Malton Moms also was the recipient of a United Way neighborhood grant that we helped them uh, put in, that they did a creative cafe and wrote a book about women's issues and empowerment of women and children in the community. Um, Malton Women's Council also implemented arts programming in the community for women. And right now, these two groups are working together to build a strategic plan that will uh, focus on building capacity, building civic capacity uh, through women. These are just shots of uh, some of the training they did together. These two groups uh, united. We also thought a key demographic that we wanted to involve in the conversation about civic literacy and advocating for, for yourself was seniors. And I would say this group is the one that we had the most success with in terms of empowering them to speak about issues that concern them. So whether it was things from icy sidewalks to uh, light, lighting not being what they wanted it to be, and even issues around their, their income tax and things I didn't even know affected seniors. These people from our presentations asked us to liaise with our elected officials, made their own meetings with them, and ha now have ongoing conversations with elected officials about issues affecting them. One of the key strengths of the Building Block pro Program in Malton is that we have become very engaged with our, our elected officials. And along with Bonnie Crombie, who's our ward counselor, we hosted a community event called Meet Your Neighbor Day, which basically gave residents an opportunity to reclaim safe space. One of the issues in Malton was uh, community safety. And um, so everyone came together and talked about their issues and how they wanted to address safety in the community. So my time is coming to an end. So what I want to skip forward to is the fact that um, we have had major success with building blocks and Malton Community Building Project to the point where two distinct projects, one that was focused on building capacity in the black community and building capacity in the South Asian community, these two groups have now decided to work together. And it's going to be a youth-centered, youth-focused model of civic engagement where they are advocating for a youth center in the community that will provide programming in visual and performing arts, um, increase civic literacy among youth, and education and health promotion for youth. I think I've, I've basically touched on everything. 
this was just a summary statement to say that we're extremely proud to have been a part of building blocks. We've created a sustainable model for civic engagement in Malton. We have created an informal network of trained individuals who are committed to continuing civic literacy in the community. We've moved from a service provider model to a resident-driven, resident-led model, which is outstanding. We have established strong relationships with elected officials in the community and increased access to those individuals so to increase our scope of influence as residents. And we have created a strong foundation for youth to make change in their community. Thanks. Thank you very much, Niambi. <clears throat> so far, the fisherman's friend is working better than the halls, just for the record. Although they're more chewable, which is kind of a problem, because I end up chewing them. You can't really chew a halls as easily as a fisherman's friend. This is important stuff. What I want to know is, do fishermen use fisherman's friend? That would be an amazing expose if we found out that only, it's like an urban thing, fisherman's friend. And fishermen are like, why? I just drink tea. What's that? Do fishermen have friends? Do fishermen have friends? Exactly. <laughs> He said that. What a great segue. Jamie Robinson, he's no friend of fishermen. He's with the United Way of Greater Toronto. He joined the United Way in 2008, and he's held a number of roles in support of the organization's Building Strong Neighborhood Strategy, which is aimed at improving conditions in communities with high concentrations of poverty. He was one of the primary authors of the United Way's Vertical Poverty Report on conditions in high-rise apartment buildings. As the team lead for neighborhoods, Jamie is now responsible for overseeing the implementation of United Way's investments in community development, community hubs, and tower neighborhood renewal. Before working at the United Way, Jamie worked as a regeneration consultant in London, England. Their loss, our gain. Please welcome Jamie Robinson. to Alejandra and, and Maitri for inviting me to be part of this. So I can share with you that United Way is in the midst of strategic planning at the moment and support for fishermen is going to be a major component <laughs> going forward. So just wanted to, to uh, settle that. Um, so I've been asked to reflect on a few of the lessons that, that we have learned in taking a city-wide approach to supporting community leaders and, and helping to strengthen civic participation across Toronto. Um, I don't want to get into the, so much of the detail of, of what we've been doing, but to sort of step back a bit from that and, and reflect on some of the lessons. Um, but 10 years ago, United Way understood an important piece of research um, in which we went out to communities, we engaged communities, and really asked them about what was working in their neighborhoods, what was working less, less well in their neighborhoods. And what we heard that, uh, through that research, it was a report called Torontonians Speak Out, very clearly was that people didn't feel like they had mechanisms, opportunities to have their voices heard, to come together Together to engage in, in civic life in, in many neighborhoods and that you know on top of the issues that they were identifying and the assets they were identifying that was a real gap that that um, kind of civic infrastructure across Toronto um, so we heard about the need for sustainable funding for community organization planning regular forums to bring people together and, and local leadership and advocacy training we then went on and we released a report called uh, Poverty by Postcode in 2004 and a number of other research reports and there was a strong neighborhood task force, all of which led us further down a, a kind of neighborhood development, um, investment in neighborhoods path. But for me, it really goes back to that, that first report and, and the, the kind of really identifying the gaps in, in that um, civic infrastructure across Toronto. Um, so out of our, our kind of neighborhoods work, we launched our Building Strong Neighborhood Strategy in 2006, which was a, a kind of, has been a major pillar of our work since then. And that's about doing two things. One is, is bringing social service infrastructure into communities that have, have really long been woefully underserved in terms of services. Um, and then the other is really the response to that earlier piece around developing enabling mechanisms and a, and a supportive environment to support and help develop um, resident communities community leadership. Um, and that's the piece that I want to talk about and reflect on um, what's working, what's not worked so well, and, and really what have we learned uh, through, throughout our experience and, and try and throw out a few uh, provocative thoughts as well. 
So just to give you a quick overview of ANC, and I will say there's a number of, of our partners here today, and, and Shelley Zuckerman was here talking about the great work they've been doing. So do seek them out, and, and they can tell you more about the work they've been doing. But it started as a pilot in 2005 as part of a federal project. It's in 13 priority neighborhoods across Toronto. It's managed and supported locally by organizations like North York Community House, and they often have an arm's length team in the neighborhood engaging, supporting residents. Um, and it's really those connection pieces going out and facilitating those connections. We've supported ANC to the tune of um, $275,000 a year in each of the first two years, and then that scaled back to about $100,000 a year um, to support the ANCs. And then they've also had additional um, access to about $100,000 worth of, of kind of community uh, funding, to kind of uh, pots of money for small local projects, resident initiated, resident led projects in their communities. So I just wanted to make it clear that ANC is, is not focused on any particular issue or challenge within, within the community, but it's really about building that infrastructure across to communities so that people can can um, come together to focus on the assets and the challenges that are relevant to their community so what have we learned um, here are a few things that, that came to mind when I asked myself that that question the first thing is you know maybe obvious but it's it's important to set clear and realistic goals and I think it's also surprisingly easy not to do this and that's certainly been you know experience of, uh, of some of the work we've been involved in and experience elsewhere but I think it you know it is a basic thing but having clarity on what we want to achieve why we want to achieve it how we want to achieve that do we have the, the resources the um, the support to achieve that and I think without that clarity it's very easy to kind of be swayed by different opportunities Opportunities and great new things and great new partners and ideas and things um, but it's also easy to get caught up with wanting to do everything so I think having that those clear and realistic goals is, is absolutely essential um, so we've supported that through a number of, of kind of resident action planning processes within communities um, I would also say that, that without the, the kind of clarity of goals, it's also easier to get caught up in the process and it becomes all about the journey and the voyage and, and kind of walking the path together without actually achieving anything on the ground and making a meaningful difference to people. So I think um, that's something we, we've experienced as well. Um, goals need to be uh, iterative. You need to modify and reflect on, on what your, your sense of uh, purpose is, what your objectives are, but having that clarity to begin with is critical. Um, a second piece is that, I can say I'm already going to run over, so just to give you the heads up, uh, community animation has been a great model for building local capacity and, and engaging residents. So in ANC, the model was, was employing local people from the community at the beginning to go out, to mobilize, to unearth the fantastic other residents, the communities in those neighborhoods. Um, and that has certainly um, paid dividends in terms of getting up and running and, and getting moving on, on some of the work. And, it, and it's been a great for those animators as well, who, many of whom are newcomers coming here, being able to get employment, being able to kind of plug into um, existing services and employment opportunities and, and to network and so forth. So the community animation has, has been a, a, a very positive thing in ANC, I think. Um, the third thing I wanted to say is I think we have uh, at times fallen prey to what Bill Trainer in the US calls a fetish with structures. And there's a rush often to let's organize, let's get a committee, let's get our terms of reference. You know, and in the UK, it's, it's the kind of bums on seats mentality. And we at United Way in the past have certainly said to our community partners, you know, you have to have a resident association. It's all about getting your resident association set up. Um, but I think that experience has, has shown, experience from elsewhere, that the form really does need to follow function. And in Lotherton, in, in the work that Shelley was talking about earlier, I think there's a great uh, articulation there of, of the kind of different levels at which people want to get involved. Some people just want to come out, they want to be involved in a project, they want to you know, do that on a kind of short-term basis, and that's great, and they should be able to do that. Other people want to be involved more in a kind of ongoing, more sustainable way. And then the third level is people who really want to be out there day and night, in and out, kind of leading change, advocating, um, and, and, and really pushing for, for change within their communities. And I think it's, it's right that people should engage in these different levels. We as, as service providers and funders need to think about how we can support their capacity development and their engagement in these different levels rather than always trying to push people towards, you know, be part of this structure, make sure, you know, you, you have all of these kind of formal things um, established. 
So that's an important piece for me. I think um, another area that we've been reflecting a lot recently is around size. In fact, size matters in neighborhoods. So there's lots of evidence from UK, from, from the US, around what works as a kind of cohesive um, uh, neighborhood. And, and really, neighborhoods of 10 to 15,000 people and in, in initiatives have been shown to work. So in Toronto, we've got priority neighborhoods that are anywhere between 15,000 and 80,000 80, people in, in some of them. Huge, huge neighborhoods aren't really neighborhoods at all, they're, they're, at all. They're, they're kind of districts within cities. Um, and over time, what's happened, rightly, is, is that the community development work has, has really picked its, its, its kind of focus so in a way that makes sense for that community. So in, in Taylor Massey, in the East End, engagement activities are focused on a community of about 10,000 people, and that feels right, and that feels like a community locally. Um, you know, but as I say, in the past, we've certainly been pushing for the kind of bigger is, is better approach, but, but that, that doesn't work. Um, I think another lesson for me on number five is investment in community infrastructure brings people together certainly, but it can also create divisions between communities. And so the, the focus, the resources, the, the, the focus on particular neighborhoods is great for those neighborhoods, but then there's always another neighborhood over the road that maybe is in similar kind of conditions but isn't getting those resources. Or another neighborhood, a more affluent neighborhood, that for them it, it just kind of confirms or reaffirms what they think they know about that neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's right that we should be focusing and targeting our resources on particular neighborhoods, um, but it's also about understanding those neighborhoods within their broader context and thinking about how and when and in what, get, in what ways do, do communities engage with their peers and, and their broader neighbors and how can some of the benefits that are coming into neighborhoods um, flow to the broader, com broader community. Um, my next lesson really is that community development is not the same as community consultation, nor is it the same as volunteer recruitment, nor is it about delivering social services. It's not the same as engaging service beneficiaries, and it's certainly not the same as having a couple of local residents on your board. Um, and those things can all be important and worthwhile, but I think there's a lot of noise around community development and community engagement. Um, and for me, kind of effective, meaningful community in engagement and, and uh, capacity building is about getting out of the way and knowing when to get out of the way, you know, and as a, as a program or a service or a funder, knowing that you're there in a kind of supportive, enabling way, but really, you know, uh, allowing and supporting residents to, to lead and, and create change from within their communities. And I understand that can be challenging and frustrating and risky for agencies and for funders and stuff, but for me, it's, it's uh, as I say, there is a, a lot of noise around community, uh, community development, I think, and, and there are a lot of things that get banded as community development. Um, the next lesson is, is capacity building is essential, absolutely, and there's lots of great evidence that points to the, the need for, for capacity building for communities, but it's not just about residents. Capacity building for agencies, for services who are engaging with, um, with communities is also um, critical. So we've invested a lot in, in resident capacity building and have got lots of fantastic kind of train the trainer models and stuff. Um, but if, if there are organizations who are used to delivering services in a certain way or, or you know, city divisions or whatever, you know, it's not a criticism. They're used to delivering agent services in those ways and, and it's understandable that they should need some, some time and support to understand maybe how they can work differently with, with residents, whether that's about you know, the time of day that a meeting is held, whether a meeting is even the best, ways of reach, the best way to reach out to people. Um, but understanding the capacity building needs right across the spectrum. Um, my next lesson, and coming to the end, is around um, a reflection, I suppose, is, is the current climate of austerity, I think, is really eroding support for, for good, solid civic infrastructure and the greater focus on kind of short-term project funding, um, fewer funders really being able to, to uh, being wanting to support the kind of operational underpinning that, that really is in, essential for this work. I think agencies that are out there trying to support this work, but also trying to do more with less. And certainly what I've observed is, is in, that, in, in this climate, really agencies kind of stepping back a bit and retrenching to you know, more of a focus on service delivery and, and some of those more, more traditional relationships. But I think the opportunities are really being missed. Um, and, and if it's just about programs and services, um, you know, the, the opportunity is being missed. And also, you know, acknowledging that actually, because there is a community development underpinning in many cases, um, you know, organizations and communities have been successful in going on and, and gaining accessing resources and things from elsewhere. 
Um, two more left. One is uh, that food, short and sweet, food is absolutely one of the most effective community development tools I think out there is out there, whether it's hot dogs or rotis or curries, whatever it is, across the priority neighborhoods and elsewhere, I know, you know, often and always starts with food. Um, and then finally, for me, the best community development models, I think, have a really strong and clear balance of, of independence on the one hand, but also influence on the other. And I think there are, um, you know, community level or community led organizations need good, strong independence. They need a clear sense of who they are and what they're about, and they need freedom and flexibility and resources to be able to take action themselves. Um, and I think acknowledging that that kind of independence takes time to develop and to grow, and, and that's fine. So on, on the ANC, as I, I mentioned, you know, our model was more intensive, more um, heavier on the resources at the beginning, and then it kind of, um, you know, it diminished later on. And a number of people have said quite rightly, I think it should have been the other way around. You know, it should have, we should have allowed the seed funding and, and the kind of slow growth to build up to something. So really to help organize communities build that independence. Um, I think community members are also often understandably starting from a point of saying, you know, you, leave, you know we're going to handle this because you guys have messed this community up or you guys have ignored us for so long. And so there's an understandable desire to kind of be independent. But for me, you know, for, for long term sustainable change in communities to be effective, it has to be about pooling the resources and looking at what resources there are right across the board and engaging service providers and having the conversations with them about this is how we want, you know, services to be delivered in our our neighborhood um, and this is why and so to give you a quick example up in Kipling we were involved in some work in, in towers up there um, supported by the, the local action for neighborhood change and there was a very simple exercise that residents went through recently you know this is what we want to do for ourselves this is what we want to do with our landlord with other service providers and this is what we want them to do with us because that's their job and that's what they're being paid to do and for me those kinds of exercises are really important and and you know really hold that balance of independence this is what we're going to do and this is what we are asking and expecting of you to do um, and there are lots of other great examples from my see across the city that, that have done that kind of thing um, elsewhere. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much um, and Thank look you, forward Jamie. to the discussion. So we're, we're running a little bit behind schedule because part of my job is to like be, be um, a tyrant and keep them at their time, but I'm a pushover and your stuff was so interesting. So I let you all go over your time a bit, which is fine with me because that was fascinating. We were going to do... Um, uh, breakouts kind of at your table, discussions, and then q and I think I'm going to flip that around and do a few quick Q&As. So if, if anyone's writing questions down, you can pass them to Alejandra and she'll pass them to me. Um, I'll start with a few questions. I'm wondering how geography affects um, the art of community engagement. In particular, I'm thinking Niambi with Malton. Malton's kind of geographically isolated from Mississauga in a lot of ways kind of separated, but also really far from City Hall. It used to be its own village. And every time municipalities amalgamate, we lose that geographic connection to City Hall. And then Adriana, with the Latin American community, unlike other cultural communities that are really focused in one neighborhood, and we know that this is where this neighborhood is and that, Latin American community is much more spread out. How does that affect your ability to organize? And uh, for Jamie, I was wondering if you could show the audience your socks, because they're amazing. I know. <laughs> At the end. At the end, okay. Yeah, that'll keep them there at the end. I don't know, they're just beautiful. They're, I've never seen socks so beautiful. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, I was looking at the socks too, checking them out, I have to say. Um, in terms of Malton, you know, politicians really hate it when we say that Malton is treated as the ugly stepchild of Mississauga, but truly it is. Um, it's in the shadow of the airport. It's isolated from Mississauga. It's logistically closer to Brampton. And um, very recently, there was a review of the electoral boundaries. And one of the recommendations was to actually remove Malton, um, parts of Malton from Mississauga and align it with Brampton, which meant that a small, the small community of Malton would actually be voting for two different representatives. So half of Malton would have been voting for a Brampton representative, and half of Malton would have been voting for a 
city of Mississauga representative, and it's hard enough to get representation when they all belong to the same person. Um, so just imagine if your neighbor is voting to elect one person and expecting sit, um, services from one city, and you are expecting from a different city, so different garbage pickup and everything. And um, the residents of Malton, we got them together. We held a town hall meeting. There were over 100 letters sent from residents to register their, their feelings that they did not want this to happen. And we brought a delegation to the Electoral Boundaries Commission meeting. And residents spoke about how they felt about it. Um, so in terms of geography affecting community development and community building and access to City Hall, it certainly does affect, especially in the case of Malton. However, if you have a group of connected, committed, empowered individuals, it's not something that you can't overcome. Uh, you definitely, we did get uh, word about two weeks ago that Malton will not be split and that Malton will remain under Mississauga. And I think that was a direct result of residents letting their voice be heard passionately. So um, I would say it does affect, proximity does affect, however it can be overcome. And is there a separatist movement, province of Malton? <laughs> there probably will be. I Star will probably it come. starts here today. That's right. It's the home of the Avro Aero, right? That's right. That's oh, amazing. Yeah. That's their motto. It is. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Adriana. Um, yes, as you say, the Latin American community is spread around all over all the GTA. However, we have found, um, looking at some uh, maps, that there is a significant group of Latin American community in the northwest area of Toronto. So we have tried geographically to concentrate our major efforts in that area. Uh, politically speaking, we are talking about War 7, A9, uh, your central west riding, your west riding. So that is what we have tried to overcome. It's also important, as I, as I say, um, there is no one Latin American community. There is people from 18 different countries. Um, so there is no the same th thing to talk about the Latin American community that is located in the Norway, that is, the, that is located in the suburbs, in the Mississauga or in Bonn. In, there are different needs, there is different uh, priority, there are different concerns. So we try to come all of them together. Uh, I think that the language has been obvi obviously, the, the, the commonality of the language is, is a great asset. We see as an asset if you, more if than you ignore Brazil. You ignore Brazil, right? Yeah. That's well, because then you have to have, well, just from, in terms of translations, yeah. what a pain. And we use uh, for sure community radio and newspapers, like Spanish newspaper. So yeah, we try to come together around this cultural richness and, and language, uh, but keeping in mind that there, we are not an homogeneous community. We are not the same. We have different concerns. We have different classes, interests. And many of the things that we propose, we always try to ask, OK, who benefits the most with this? OK. Jamie, we have a question here about funding and sustainability. So United Way offers programs. We are also one of the major funders in the city. The question was, how are these projects sustainable when it comes to funding? Do any of them have long-term projections? And you mentioned austerity. So what is the path forward for organizations represented in this room in a time when everyone's supposed to be tightening the belt, but we all know that these projects, to do them well, does cost a lot of money? So thanks for that question. And, and the question to the funder always comes, the first question is always about money. Um, so, so, you know, I did talk about the need for ongoing sustainable long-term funding and, and recognizing that. That's a, a challenge for organizations, it's a challenge for us. We've been supporting ANC now for seven years. Um, you know, there is some fantastic work that is happening out there. Um, and we are, I'm certainly in my team making a case for, for making sure that work is, is continued. There is an acceptance that, you know, community change takes time, that we have to have investment in these, um, in, in strong community infrastructure. Um, and I think at United Way, we're, we're certainly very much committed to that. I think one of our, you know, when, when we got into the strong neighborhood stuff, um, there are all these uh, goals around kind of tripartite agreements 
governments and all this sort of stuff with, with government. Um, and a lot of that hasn't really panned out. And, and there are very few funders who are at the table who are providing that kind of ongoing sustainable funding. So one of our goals over the coming years is to really regroup with our friends at the city, with other foundations. So we'll be coming and, and talking to Maitri um, about what, you know, how we can better coordinate. Because again, I think there are resources out there as well. It's, it's not always as, as well coordinated as, as it can be. Okay, we're going to take the last two questions, and they're going to be questions for you to discuss at your tables. Actually, a third one. The first one is, can someone overdose on Fisherman's Friend? I need to know, because I've had at least 20. I think I'm really okay. Um, so there's a question to Adriana, which I'm going to deflect from you back to you uh, in the context of another question. It says, I agree that Latin Americans have a long history of political involvement in their countries of origin. However, some of these experiences or involvement have been outside of the system or underground. How do you adapt these to working within the system? How do you get people to trust the government? And another question here says, I'd like to hear more about how to reach people who are not already organized, engaged, or active. And for whatever reason, people might not be engaged because they're busy, because they don't have faith in the system, because they don't have confidence in their own beliefs, or become, because they come from a place where being engaged was dangerous. Um, so I'd like for you to spend the next, we have four or five minutes left, at your own tables, learning from what you heard today, but also sharing your own experiences. How do we get beyond the usual suspects? How do we get beyond us and engage those who um, aren't here now, but we know they care about the city, we know they want to get involved? How do we make it easy enough for those who are busy? And how do we create the culture of confidence where people know that their efforts will make a difference? You've got four minutes to do that. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot, and I want, I want you to solve that problem <laughs> concretely. <laughs> solve that problem, please. solved this conundrum. Okay, two hands, that's not bad. Okay, maybe you need another 20 seconds. Okay, how about now? Okay, that's okay, we don't need to solve this today. We've planted seeds. Um, folks, if I could have your attention for one second. If I could have everyone's attention, you can keep talking at your tables once I'm done. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to uh, have a little break in between sessions. The next session, if you look up at the screen, you can see which room you need to be in at 345. In between now and 345, you can mingle. You can have some snacks if there are any. There's tables out there with information. Coach House is there selling some books. I've got some panels in the back from an exhibit I did last year called The Fourth Wall about how to make local democracy more inclusive. 
I'd like to ask everyone to thank our three panelists, Adriana, Niambi, and Jamie.